morning, everybody. My name is Katherine Becker Van Haste from Senator Sanders' office. I want to start out by welcoming everyone and thanking you for being here today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed all of our great organizations who are out front. Uh, I really thank all of them for being here, um, and thank you all for coming. I know for some of you this was a bit of a drive, so we really appreciate you making the time. Um, before we get started, I just have a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, after we finish, we'll go through, um, the Senator is going to speak, then we'll be joined by Matthew Schumann from the American Legion in Washington, D.C., our great Vermont panelists. Um, after that, we'll have some Q&A, so please think about your questions as they're speaking. After the question and answer period finishes up, we're going to have boxed lunches available. Um, you will see on your table there are some topics that um, you can join in on for those. We've got some great folks who are going to help facilitate those conversations. But really, anything that you want to talk about, feel free during that uh, lunchtime discussion uh, to really talk about whatever is on your mind. Um, we will also have the resource tables avail open again during that period, so you can visit with any folks that you didn't get a chance to talk to then. Um, I would also mention that if you have specific issues um, with your own individual um, cases, we have folks from the VA, from the Senator's Office, our casework team, as well as the Vermont Office of Veterans Affairs, our Vermont Veterans Outreach Program, the VSOs. So if you have individual specific needs that we can help with, um, that would be a great time to talk about those particular individual instances. So with that, I want to again thank you all for being here and introduce you to someone who needs no introduction, Senator Sanders. Thank you, Katie. Now, how would you like to go through life being introduced as someone who needs no introduction? See, other people get these flowery, great introductions. They say, no introduction. All right. Uh, Katie did a great job in organizing the event. And, and I just, let me start off by, of course, thanking uh, the men and women in the room who have put their lives on the line to defend our country. And our goal here and hopefully every day is to make sure that your sacrifices and the sacrifices of your families are not forgotten. And we do everything we can to make life as good as we possibly can uh, for our veterans. And I want to thank uh, all of the organizations. It just blows me away and makes me very proud uh, that as I walked around uh, the room there to see so many great organizations of people who have dedicated their lives to trying to help uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and, and veterans uh, all over this country. So I want to thank uh, all of the organizations who are here. Uh, I want to thank our panelists today. Uh, you're going to be hearing from uh, Matt uh, Schumann in, in a bit. Matt is the uh, legislative director, uh, national legislative director for the American Legion, uh, the largest uh, veteran service organization in the country. He does a great job. Uh, as the, the other service organizations, and he'll be talking to you about what's going on in D.C. Uh, and I want to thank Don Doctor, who is the adjutant of the Vermont VFW. Uh, John Minor is with the Vietnam Veterans. John is not here today, unfortunately. Uh, Perry Melvin will do a great job uh, subbing for him. Uh, Heather Morris is with the Vermont Veterans Outreach Program. Uh, Fred Latour is with the American Legion of Vermont. And Dr. Brett Rush, as you may know, is the acting director of the VA uh, Center at White River. Uh, let me be um, just very informal and, and say that what we want here is for you to learn as much as you can, and in any way my office or the VA or any of the service organizations can be of help to you, do not be shy. That's what this meeting uh, is all about. Um, in my view, and I speak to you as a longtime member of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs and the former chair of it, uh, I think that this country has a moral obligation to make sure that we do everything possible we can uh, to provide the help and support that the veterans of this country need. Um, there has been a lot of controversy and discussion about the VA. So let me give you my feelings about the VA. 
And that is to say that like any other medical organization in this country, VA has its problems, and nobody here will deny that. But what I will never forget, as long as I live, I was, Matt, you may remember this, I was chairman of the VA, and we had the American Legion and the VFW and the DAV and the Vietnam Vets and every major service organization right up in front in a hearing that was nationally televised. And I asked all of the organizations, tell me truthfully, when people get into the VA system, do they do a good job? And without exception, every single one of the veterans organizations said, good, good, excellent, very good, whatever it is. And I, in my experience, here in Vermont at least, can tell you that the veterans of our state are very proud of the quality service they get from the staff at White River. And I want to thank that staff very much. And over the years, we have made uh, some progress in expanding the number of community-based outreach clinics, CBOX from three to five. Uh, we added one a few years ago in Brattleboro, one up in Newport, uh, along with the ones we have in Burlington uh, and uh, Rutland uh, as well. So let me talk a little bit about some of the issues uh, that are taking place and some of the concerns uh, that I have. All of you are aware, and I don't mean to be political here today, and I sincerely don't, that there are differences of opinion of what we should be doing with federal programs. Uh, there are folks who would like to significantly cut or privatize Social Security. President proposed a trillion dollar cut in his budget to Medicaid, $500 billion cut in Medicare. There are people who want to move toward the privatization of the U.S. Postal Service. And the Veterans Administration is also part of that effort. So right now, what we have in Washington is an effort on the part of some people to say, hey, we got a $200 billion VA budget. Wouldn't it be better to kind of move toward the privatization of the VA and take more services outside of the VA? And let me tell you my view. My view is that at a time when we have 30,000 vacancies in the VA, the most important thing that we can do right now is to fill those vacancies and make sure that the VA is providing the quality care that it needs. Second of all, there are programs out there that need to be strengthened. Some years ago, when I first came into the Senate, I worked with others, including a senator named Jim Webb of Virginia, who was very active. And what we worked on is improving educational benefits for veterans, something we have to continue doing. The other thing that we did is develop what is called a caregivers program. People familiar with the caregivers program? Now, one of the issues that we don't talk about a whole lot is that if a veteran comes home with a severe disability, either physical or maybe emotional, who is taking care of that veteran? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Often it is the wife, sister, brother, family member. And those family members by the tens of thousands have devoted their lives to taking care of those disabled veterans. Now what happened is a number of years ago, we finally passed something that we call the caregivers bill. It's not the end all, but what it said for post 9-11, just for the post 9-11 veteran generation, that the caregivers who were taking care of the disabled from 9-11 on would be able to get caregivers benefits. What does that mean? If you are taking care of somebody who has a disability, you gotta be on duty seven days a week. You don't get any help at all. It means the world if you can get a replacement to come in for one or two days. It means the world if you can get a modest stipend because many of those people, mostly women by the way, have given up their own careers. 
Bottom line is to recognize the sacrifice, not only of the veterans, but of those people who are caring for the veterans. We made progress. We have a Caregivers Act uh, for post 9-11. It has got to be expanded to all generations. All right, that means going back to World War II, to Korea, to Vietnam, etc. Now, we're making some progress on that. But in Washington, things are very complicated because you got an authorization process and then you got an appropriations process. So the authorization committee, which I'm on, can do all kinds of great things, doesn't mean much unless we have the money to fund it. So right now, what we are trying to do is expand the caregivers program for all generations and to make sure that the funding is adequate uh, to take care of the needs of all generations. All right, there's another issue uh, out there that I have worked very, very hard on with not the kind of success that I wish I could tell you about. I happen to believe that when you talk about health care, you are talking about dental care, yeah? Now right now, right now as you know, uh, the VA does provide dental care for service-connected oral needs. They do not provide uh, dental care for non-service-connected needs. And I tried very hard. Uh, we wrote a bill uh, some years ago, which was the most comprehensive reform of the VA in modern history, supported by all of the veterans' organizations, which would have included uh, dental care. Uh, unfortunately, we were four votes shy of getting it passed in the Senate. But that's something that I will uh, continue uh, to work on. There is another area where, in fact, the VA and the DOD have been leaders all in, in this country in terms of health care. I don't have to tell anybody in this room about the terrible, terrible opioid crisis uh, that is sweeping this country. We lose over 100 people a year in Vermont to opioid uh, overdoses. New Hampshire is even facing a more serious crisis. Uh, what the VA is trying to do, and has for a number of years, been trying to figure out ways to deal with pain, which is a very serious issue for veterans, in a way that makes sure that these men and women do not get hooked on opioids. And the VA and the DOD, for that matter, have been leading the country in looking at what we call complementary approaches. How can you deal with pain without getting people hooked up on powerful drugs. And they've been looking at uh, acupuncture, and they've been looking at massage, and they've been looking at uh, all kinds of different yoga, all kinds of different therapies, which might seem strange, but in fact are scientifically tested and in fact can make real progress uh, for veterans. And that's an area uh, that we want to expand as well. Another area that is getting more attention, obviously, is more and more women join the military is to make sure that women get the health care, their health care needs adequately taken care of. And I'm proud that a few years, uh, and I'm proud that uh, a few years ago we started the women's clinic uh, at White River, and my understanding is that clinic is doing a very good job uh, for the women of our state. So there is a lot uh, that is, is going on. Um, and a lot of the debate in Washington has to do not only with veterans' issues, what is the proper role of government in our society? Do we believe that retirement security through Social Security should be a right, or should we privatize that? Is health care through Medicare and Medicaid a right or not? Veterans' issues, the same thing. So with that, um, let me again thank everybody for being here. The goal today is to get as much information as we can to you. Please ask questions. Please take advantage of the many organizations who are here today. And without uh, further ado, let me introduce uh, Matt Schumann. Uh, Matt is uh, really one of the more knowledgeable people in this country on what's going on in Washington and veterans issues in general. Matt, thank you very much for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. This is a room of veterans. I expected it to be just a little bit louder. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
There we go. Listen, I've never had anybody ever tell or tell a room of people that I am the more knowledgeable person. Instantly, right off the bat, I'm very uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, let me real quick thank everybody here. I know all of you were invited to the royal wedding and you guys chose to come here this morning instead. I really appreciate that. Um, let me also extend a, a, a very sincere and, and kind and genuine thank you to Senator Sanders for inviting me here. He's a very staunch supporter. He, what he's already mentioned to you is a very brief, very, very topical of everything that's going on before the Senate and the House in terms of, of veterans' issues. You guys are extremely lucky to have not only a senator who is a former chairman of that committee, but also someone who genuinely cares. Just this week, I was sitting in his office with other veteran organizations, and this man walks in, and with gusto behind him, is like, how can we get this done? What can we work on? What do you need from me? And he had very sincere and genuine questions. You don't see that a lot. So if you guys could just join me real quick in a round of applause for a man who does great work for Vermont. I, I am a United States Army veteran. Can I get a hello from anybody? There we go. I was a former military police officer. That's, that's, where, the booze come, <laughs> that's where the booze come in. Um, I left the MP Corps and was honored to join the Honor Guard and provide military funerals uh, and things of that nature throughout my service. In my role now as the legislative director for the American Legion, as Senator Sanders said, we're the largest veteran service organization, not just in the country, but the world. And to have that honor bestowed upon me um, as a post-911 veteran is, is pretty fantastic and something that I, I just go home energized and come home to the office energized, except for when I'm, when I, when I'm tired and I'm working late. Uh, you know, the American Legion has 13,000 local posts throughout the world. That is more locations than Walmart. I like to tell people that just so you have the general sense of how large this organization is, that's because of the people who have joined us. We have two million members. It's no shock that those numbers have decreased over time. Younger veterans aren't joining the, you know, the, the veteran organizations, but it's something that we have to change. I don't know if you guys know this, but the American Legion created the original GI Bill. And every single time since, we've been at the helm of making sure, along with the other organizations at this table, to make sure that the, that GI Bill is extended to take care of those veterans and the people in this room. We just passed a new GI Bill, thanks to someone like Senator Sanders, that removes the timeline. When you got out of the military, sir, you only had 15 years to use your GI Bill before it dissipated and went away. A couple months ago, we made it a, a lifetime benefit. And things like that is, is what we need to be doing all the time. Sort of the, the theme for this, for this conversation that we're having now is, there's a principle we all learn in the military. It's to leave our area of operation better than the way we found it. Am I right? And that's what we have to do every single day. You have to get engaged to make sure that the services and the benefits that, you, that we get as veterans are better for the next generation. So one of the questions that was proposed to me is, is why, are, why are VSOs, why are veteran service organizations like the American Legion important? Easily said, we, can, you know, we do a lot of work for veterans. My job in particular is to lobby Capitol Hill. It's to go to Capitol Hill and meet with people like Senator Sanders and your other congressional uh, uh, officials and help them review legislation, ideas that they have, put it in the text, and pass a bill. It's not as easy as Senator Sanders saying, I've got this bill and I want to help you know, get dental services for veterans. But you heard him say that it failed by four votes. So we come in and we come in together with the VFW and the DAV and the VVA, and we are a powerhouse and we go to every single member of Congress, all 535, and say, this has to happen for the people that have selflessly raised their right hand to defend this country. Quickly wanted to sort of shift into the conversation of the VA. I'm 29 years old. A lot of people say, you don't even look like you're a veteran. One, I'm sexy. That's why. <laughs> but younger veterans, the perception is they don't want to go to the VA. They hear all these different stories on Fox News and CNN saying how bad the VA is. Would you guys be shocked to hear that 82% of veterans who use the VA want to receive their medical services at VA? See, you guys know that. But Fox News and everybody else is reporting different stories. See, when, when, when the VA messes up one time, it's going to be on TV. Why? Because they're a federal agency and they have to. They have to be transparent. But the local hospital down the street, they're a business. 
They don't want you to know that unless you go to your local TV channel and tell them. Another stat that I find really telling, and I, there was a nurse I was speaking to earlier this morning, 62% of clinicians receive some level of medical training at the VA. That's amazing. The VA is one of the biggest research agencies in the, in the world. The VA, you think about sort of battle-borne illness as sort of three things that come to mind. TBI, PTSD, and prosthetics. The VA is the world leader in prosthetic research and care. The world leader, not Pfizer, not someone else, not another country, the VA. The VA created Tylenol. They created the nicotine patch. They are doing wonderful and magnificent research that actually impacts the medical community, not just here, not just for veterans, but for the world. And it's relatively amazing, and people don't really understand this. Battleborne illness is a conversation that should be had. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a veteran going out to the community down the street to get some type of medical service. But it is so often that a veteran will go into their private clinician and have symptoms of PTSD, and their doctor says, oh, you, you just got anxiety. You're just you're nervous. Here, you know, here's some ADHD medication or something. And they get misdiagnosed. But you go to the VA, and these people are trained to take care of veteran medicine. These people are trained to understand and actually be able to sit down and talk to you and hopefully understand what you're going through and hopefully let you know that they genuinely care about you and that it's not 30 seconds with a private clinician. That's what this VA is about. We've got people, <clears throat> as Senator Sanders said, who want to privatize the VA. Let me draw what that looks like real quick. That's a VA who's just going to be an insurance company. When was the last time you actually met somebody from Blue Cross Blue Shield? <clears throat> we fight for the red, white, and blue, not Blue Cross and Blue Shield, y'all. We don't want the VA to be privatized. We don't want them to just pay for our, our, our medical services. We want them to provide our medical services. We want to be able to go to the VA and say, listen, I'm, just, I'm having some issues, man. And then not ask you, point to your face, what happened? And corner you in your room and try to badger you to get more information. They understand and they, they are sensitive to those topics. They're saying that we don't want to talk about. Private clinicians want you to do that. The VA needs to be a robust, it needs to be a very thorough system, and it needs to always be there for veterans to get the treatment they need. In short, the simple reality is we need to be engaging members of Congress like Senator Sanders and supporting them who are truly fighting to make sure the VA is a robust and a brick and mortar system. I understand if you want to go down the street and get treated for a cold, that's cool. But the VA needs to, sorry, the VA needs to be the world leader, just like they are in prosthetics with TBI and PTSD. And the more money that we take out and send to the community is not going to help them get there. So why should you care beyond the fact that you're a veteran, beyond the fact that your spouse is a veteran and you're helping take care of them? Because we need to make sure, just as I said earlier, that we leave this system better than the way we found it. The VA has a $200 billion budget. Senator, 10 years ago, it wasn't even that, am I right? It's because we got people like Senator Sanders who sit down and say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. We need more money for the VA. We need to make sure that the caregiver program is expanded. We need to be able to make sure that Choice has the funding, that it's not going to run out in 12 days. Simple reality is there's ways that you can do this. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to go to Washington, D.C. But what you need to do, and I beg of you, is join a veteran service organization. I'm not going to advocate just for the American Legion, but join one of these organizations. What we have is the, is the power and the ability to affect change on Capitol Hill. When someone comes to us and says, hey, you know what? I've heard the stories. We've all heard the stories of how bad Army dentists are, but we need to make sure that these people get the dental care that they deserve. And I need your help to get it done. And next thing you know, you've got thousands of American legions, you've got thousands of DAV and VFW banging on the door of these members of Congress who don't want to do anything, don't want to spend any money on veterans. I don't know about y'all, but when I raised my right hand, I didn't say, you know what, to this limit, right? If I get broken, you better dang on fix it. It's that simple. The reality is, is we got to care. You guys need to get involved. 
When was the last time you guys called Senator Sanders' office? What was about a week ago? He calls too much, doesn't he? <laughs> Don't call every week, sir. Catherine is a busy woman. But when was the last time every single person here, I want you to ask yourself, when was the last time you engaged a member of Congress and said, hey, listen, this benefit matters to me. I want to make sure this benefit is better. Some crazy guy came to me several, uh, two years ago and said, why don't we get rid of the, of the cap on the GI Bill and make it a lifetime benefit? And I was like, that's a good idea. We need people like that. You have the ability to do that. You've got a senator who's got some influence on this committee. You all need to start engaging members of Congress and supporting them. I can go to Senator Sanders' office. I can go to Paul Ryan's office and say, hey, this is what I'm hearing from my members. But if he can't say, you know what, I'm hearing that from people in Vermont, it's not going to do anything. Y'all need to get active. Y'all need to tell your members of Congress what, what you see, what you're feeling, not just when it's bad. We're all so quick when we go to a restaurant to tell the manager when the waitress or the server has done something wrong, but we're never the ones to tell them that they do a great job today. We need to start doing that. We need to start telling members of Congress when the VA does great by you. Yes, the VA has problems, and they are slowly, they are slowly getting fixed, but we as a community of veterans, our service does not stop and did not stop when we left and we ETS out of the military. We have a different type of drive in us. Y'all are here on a Saturday instead of being at the royal wedding, I'm telling you. So let me, let me end with this. I want to thank each of you for your service. I want to beg you to continue your service. Get involved. It's not the sexiest thing in the world to go join an American Legion post or a VFW, but lend your support. Don't stop when you left the military. I want to thank Norwich. I think it's pretty spectacular that we're having a conversation about veterans at a university that puts more commissioned officers in the military second after West Point. Go Army, beat Navy. <laughs> And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll close with two things. One, I wanted to again thank Senator Sanders and his entire staff for putting on a wonderful event. I think more senators, I was telling them this earlier, more senators need to get involved and start doing things like this. And I think we'll see a different type of VA system that is actually there for veterans. And then I'll say this one last thing. I already said it. We need to leave the services and the benefits and the programs better than the way we found it. That is your job. It didn't stop, like I said, when you left the military. So get involved, get active, and except for him, everybody else needs to start calling Senator Sanders' office and let him know what's going on. I thank you guys. Thank you, Matt. Um, Don Doctor is the adjutant of the Vermont VFW. Don. Thank you, Senator. That's going to be a hard act to follow. Um, like you said, my name is Don Doctor. I'm a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, state of, state of Vermont. I'm past state commander, 2015-16, current adjutant, which means I push a lot of papers. Um, the Veterans of Foreign Wars really, really is against privatization of, also privatization of the VA um, healthcare. Um, little story of when when I was state commander, it was the anniversary date of all the blow up with the VAs where they actually, patients were dying like in Phoenix and, and uh, Denver VA. And because it was the anniversary, one of the local news stations uh, reporters was there on the campus of the VA a hospital, White River Junction. We happened to be there that day because our commander in chief of our national organization out of Kansas City was there. We were um, interviewing the, we were doing an interview with the in interim director of the VA, the, uh, the, the lady, and I can't remember her name, she was pulled and sent down to Phoenix to straighten that mess out down there. And so he was telling us, this interim director was telling us the story of this local news reporter and she was told not to go into the hospital itself and interview veterans. So she waited on the periphery of the parking lot. And we sat there and watched her and um, a veteran would come out, she'd interview him for maybe 30 seconds, he'd be gone. And this went on nine, 10 veterans, all of a sudden one veteran come out and he was doing this number. You could tell he wasn't happy. 
guess what was on the news that night? It was, it was that guy, yeah. So don't believe everything you can say about or hear about the news. <clears throat> There's organizations such as us, the American Legion, which I'm a member of, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, Fleet Reserve Association. There's many of them that you can get information of what's going on and what our senators are doing in D.C. So, and Matt was right. Uh, we're fortunate in that uh, we have the legislators that we do have here in Vermont <clears throat> looking or watching out for us veterans. Uh, what they're doing for us is, is phenomenal. Um, Bernie knows that we have every March, the Veterans Foreign Wars has a legislative conference in Washington, D.C. The purpose of that is, is we send our, our leaders down there to meet with each of our two senators and our congressmen about our concerns um, of Veterans Affairs. And they bring us into their offices and we tell them what's, what our concerns on and, and they take it to heart. It's like Matt was saying, what can we do? How do we solve it? And, and they can take it. Um, like I said, I'm a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. We are 1.7 million strong. Matt says they're the, strong, they're, the, they're the largest veterans organization. They are, I'll give them that. We are the largest combat veterans organization in the United States. Um, so I have to put our plug in there, Matt. Um, the, uh, and including with our auxiliary, we're about 2.5 million strong. That makes a difference when you go down to Washington, D.C., and they see a na name tag or a hat that says VFW or American Legion on it. They listen because they know they, there's a pretty good voting contingent there. And like Matt was saying, you need to get involved, not only in federal, but local. Look at what's going on local in Vermont. Um, Governor Scott just put, on, put a bill on there about um, exempting military retirement pay. Well, the general consensus going around with our legislators is yeah, they make enough money, they don't need another break. Um, I'd like to, I did 20 years, I'd like to have them live off my pension. It ain't gonna happen, so. Um, we have our own Veterans Affairs VFW service officer in White River Junction. His name is Joe LaPearl. He's a retired first sergeant, in the United States Army and he has an assistant named Jackie. Um, the DAV and the American Legion also has service officers down there. So if you're putting in a claim, it's highly recommended. I, I know every one of these, and, and the state of Vermont has three uh, service officers work, working out of Montpelier. I did see Paul Perot here earlier. There, oh, he's in the back. But, uh, and I was here, I lived in Vermont 15 years before I even knew we had veteran service officers for the state of Vermont. So they're there, utilize them. If you're putting in any type of claim with the VA, nothing against the VA, but it, it, I, I would definitely encourage you to get with one of these veteran service officers, make sure, it just hastens the whole procedure. They make sure they, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted um, before you go forward with your paperwork, okay? On the privatization of, uh, uh, I, um, Thursday, the House just passed the uh, bill on uh, uh, the VA Mission Act, um, and I'm reading off our action course weekly. The House and Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs to improve VA health care, fix ongoing issues with the current choice program, consolidate community care programs, expand caregiver benefits to pre-9-11 veterans, and improve VA's infrastructure to better serve veterans. They passed that Thursday. Now it's up for the senators, and I'm sure Senator Sanders is going to be all over that because that's got to be done by May 31st to go into effect, correct? So. Um, back in 2016, um, they did a commission on care. They, they made 18 recommendations. Uh, the Veterans of Foreign Wars organization um, did, um, they went along with all but all 18, all 17 of them with the exception of one, and that was the private, privatization of healthcare. I'm going to read you what our findings were. The VFW believes VA needs leadership, not management by committee. Similar to the Commission on Care, the governor's board would include political appointees, the majority of whom would be civilian health care executives and veterans who do not use the VA benefits system. The VFW recommends reforming the congressional appropriations process to ensure VA receives 
the resources it needs to meet veterans' health care needs instead of limiting how much care VA is able to provide. I'll read that again. The veterans' health care needs instead of limiting how much VA care VA is, is able to provide. There should be no limit to that funding. If a, if a veteran needs, needs help, they should be getting it, okay? The Secretary of Veterans Affairs and the President must continue to provide oversight and management of the VA health care system with or without gov governance board. This means that the VH health, VHA leadership will have an additional management and reporting requirement which will only serve to further stymie the needed transformation process. Why do we want to have the VA health care in the hands of somebody that has never worn the uniform in the United States? Thank you. Thank you, Don. And now representing the Vietnam Veterans of America, Perry Melvin. Perry. Thank you, Senator Sanders. I want to say welcome home, not just the Vietnam veterans, but all veterans. We really appreciate what you've done. Thank you. The Vietnam Veterans of America really began in the, the 70s. We are the smallest organization. We're only 97,000 strong, but again, strong. And working diligently, one, for not just benefits for uh, Vietnam veterans, but all veterans. But initially, our organization started out to take care of ourselves. We felt that that was necessary. But then we adapt, adapted the uh, motto of never again will one group of veterans leave another behind. So we've extended our services to all veterans from our World War II on down to our present veterans, knowing that they need services, whether it's a VSO, a veteran service um, uh, or, uh, or officers, or it's uh, just benefits in general, information. On a national level, we do everything from benefit programs. I'm fortunate to be part of that committee, so we look at everything from compensation to pension, not only how it's going to affect Vietnam veterans, but again, all veterans, making sure that that expands and includes all. Legislative work, become familiar with our House and our Senate bills, supporting them, some cases promulgating them and supporting our, our senators and uh, our legislators and certainly uh, Senator uh, Sanders has been a, a big help to us and we appreciate what he's done. Agent Orange, again, our bills that have gone in with Agent Orange initially were just to affect the Vietnam veterans to support them, but now it's expanded to include our recent bills, everything from uh, the um, um, uh, veterans who were exposed uh, to uh, burn uh, pits to ones to the radiated uh, um, uh, artillery that was used uh, during um, in, in uh, Afghanistan to everything because again these veterans as well need that services they need to be covered incarcerated veterans we have we have chapters we don't have one in Vermont we have one in Hampshire we have them throughout the country we have veterans in prisons and they need support so we have chapters and we support those veterans to make sure when they get out they help they have us along with uh, whoever else is there to support them, family, to get them on the right to paths. Health and welfare, PTSD. Every, all of our veterans are suffering from a certain extent, so we want to ensure and continue to ensure that that, that program is supported and that uh, benefits, or rather our, our veterans are getting that uh, appropriate benefits. Women's services. I had the for, a fortunate uh, experience of being able to sit down with several uh, chapter, uh, uh, rather state council presidents who were women, who were nurses, and they told me when they first went to the VA, there wasn't even a, a, uh, a uh, bathroom for them, let alone services. So they worked diligently along with other, all other organizations to provide services, more extensive services to women. As uh, uh, Senator Sanders talked about the, the program that we have at the VA now, which is fantastic. I've heard great things from uh, a lot of people. My wife is a, um, uh, just retired as a nursing professor and she hears good things from other people about what, uh, what goes on at that program. In some ways wishes she could access that, but she's not a veteran. <clears throat> 
I do want to share something I think is important. When I was, um, I went to school, uh, graduate school at Washington University in social work. And my first experience in getting some, uh, um, uh, you know, out, outreach in the community and be involved in a, a program to be able to extend uh, my training it was at John Cochran VA Hospital. I sat there in 1978 with every type of healthcare personnel in a circle and in the middle of that circle was the patient and his family. We didn't talk around that person, we talked with them. We asked them questions, we asked them to tell us about their healthcare needs. We asked them to tell us about what they needed. We developed a plan to route them. Fifteen years later in a hospital in, in, in uh, Massachusetts where I was the director of social services, that program started. It took 15 years to get out into the, the public, but it was a VA that started that, really putting the patient first as the center. <clears throat> We've our watchdogs, we're looking not only at the national level of what goes on in terms of Congress for bills, but we're looking locally. We have a lot of important ones. The ones were mentioned before, um, House Bill uh, 626, which is benefit and benefit pe uh, pensions. Again, we are seeing many of our veterans leaving the state because once they retire, whatever they have for pensions and, or rather for benefits, uh, whether it's pension or it's compensation, and they get Social Security, they can't live on that in Vermont. So they're going to Florida, they're going to Tennessee, they're going to other states where one, they're getting all kinds of re reductions in their taxes so that they can, one, they're spending their money in the states. The states that they're going to and adopting, uh, that they've adopted, are getting the money back, but it's creating jobs, it's maintaining jobs, it's creating new businesses, but we're not doing that here in Vermont. We're losing our, our, uh, our veterans, and we need to keep these veterans here in the state. Have them spend their money here as opposed to leaving the state because they can't support to live to be here. So again, I support our, our, all these bills that are going on in the state uh, level. And, we, and again, I ask you, as has been uh, requested before, join a veterans organization. Doesn't have to be the VVA, of course you can, <laughs> unless you are a veteran. One last thing I want to point out, the VNA, v, Vietnam veterans average age now is 68. So what we're in the process of doing is we're looking at dissolution. We will disappear. We will turn out the lights at some point in time. So we have two major committees going on. One committee is looking at when and how do we close up shop and disappear uh, as an organization. And secondly, looking at how we can take all of what we've learned and put it into an organization that's not Vietnam veterans, it's a general, pass it on to our young veterans, and we're talking to them now and say, take our experiences, take our resources, take everything, and run with it. We're not going to tell you what to do and how to do it, but take that, because it's important that you have something to work with and that we can pass something on to you. I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you, and thank you very much, and again, welcome home. You know, Perry reminded me of something, and that is, and, you know, and that is what Matt and others have, uh, Don, have talked about. Change doesn't take place unless people get involved. All of you remember the story of Asian Orange? Remember what happened there? We had people coming back from Vietnam who were dealing with this very, very heavy-duty chemical. You know, it's designed to wipe out forests, to wipe out life. And Dow Chemical and others say, oh, this is perfectly safe. You remember that? No problem. And then people were suddenly coming back and they were developing all kinds of diseases, terrible diseases. And the struggle took place with some good people in Congress, a fellow named Lane Evans in Illinois, who was a good friend of mine who has since passed away, a Vietnam era veteran. And it took an enormous amount of work, Very that right? For VA finally to acknowledge the lethality, the danger of this chemical compound and what it did to so many thousands of uh, our brothers and sisters who were in Vietnam. So, uh, but that didn't happen by accident. It happened because not only Vietnam veterans, but the other service organizations, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a lawsuit. I think it was literally a lawsuit brought forth. I don't know if it was the American Legion or the other. 
who forced the, v the VA to finally acknowledge it. But that's how change uh, takes place, when people stand up and they fight for it. Uh, now we have Heather Morris, uh, who is working with the Vermont Veterans Outreach Program. And here's a program that does very, very important work, and, and Heather will describe it. But one of the concerns that some of us had is that when veterans come home from conflict, especially in a rural area like Vermont, they can isolate themselves. They're dealing with a problem. And they, for whatever reason, one of the symptoms of the problem is not seeking help. And we thought it was a good idea to get veterans themselves to go out into the community to talk to veterans, to get them into the VA if they needed to get to the VA or other type of medical help. So Heather is doing a great job. Uh, please welcome Heather Morris with the Vermont Veterans Outreach Program. Heather. Hi, um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. I got the longest one, I feel kind of special so far. <laughs> um, so yes, my name's Heather Morris. Um, I currently work for Vermont Veterans Outreach. Um, I've been on board about a year. Um, and I told my boss just the other day, it is still my dream job. Um, so I'm a veteran. I served in the United States Navy from um, 2000 to 2004. And um, I'm kind of surprised I'm the only female up here at the table, but pretty honored at the same time. So I hopefully I do a good job, ladies. Um, <clears throat> I came to work at Vermont Veterans Outreach because I came back to Vermont um, and finally enrolled in the VA and you know all that other stuff. Self-identified after 14 years of being separated from the Navy, um, honorably. <laughs> Just throw that out there. And um, <laughs> so uh, I went to college and I was like, I'm going to use my GI Bill. And um, I started in exercise science and was like, wow, uh, anatomy and physiology is really not my thing. So I went into the psychology fields and um, just decided to go to a club meeting there on campus for the veteran service organization on campus and was the president like a month later. They realized that I really like to talk <laughs> and I could keep a room entertained. So it was a really great experience and I absolutely loved it. And through that work with the veteran community completely on a volunteer basis, I realized that this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. I want to help veterans. Um, and now I am integrated in my community and I get to meet new veterans every single day. And then I get to see all the ones that I recognize at all these wonderful events, which is just as fun. Um, but being able to speak on the phone with a World War II veteran who just doesn't have anybody to talk to today is really fun. And then meeting a veteran who just came home from Afghanistan and he doesn't really want to go to the VA, he's just as much fun to talk to. So I really do have the greatest job in the world <laughs> um, and I'm honored to be here today. Um, a couple of things I wanted to bring up, I'm not um, as much on the political level as everybody else up here at the table. <laughs> um, I'm the one that's here in Vermont meeting the veterans in the community. Um, I also live in the NEK which is um, Orleans, Essex County, and the northern half of Caledonia. That's my part of the map on the team. There's 10 of us throughout the state. We cover the entire state. Um, <clears throat> we are a one-stop shop for veterans. Um, no matter what a veteran says to me, I'm going to find the resources and the information that they need, and then I'm going to follow up, and I'm going to make sure that they've contacted the Department of Labor and written that resume. And I'm going to call and follow up and make sure that they made their appointment at the VA. Um, and I'm going to call and follow up and just check on them and see how they're doing. I don't always call. Normally I get to go visit them as well, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and I go to my community partner meetings and I educate things like the Hunger Council. And I educate um, the community partners, the Agency of Human Services, on veterans' needs within our community. And the reason that I get to do this is because I am a veteran and I work for this wonderful organization. Um, so some things going on in Vermont. Um, that I see is obviously the transportation issue to the VA hospital. I love the VA hospital. It's really great. Sometimes I don't get somebody to answer the phone, but otherwise we're good. Um, but getting veterans from my area up in the NEK on the Canadian border to an appointment can be very, very difficult. And um, unfortunately, our organization is no longer able to transport veterans. So um, that's a huge issue. Another issue that um, I take personally because it took me 14 years to finally say, hey, 
I'm a veteran, <laughs> um, is that women self-identifying as veterans when they leave the service, being proud of that. Um, I actually uh, met a really amazing woman in Florida. Her name's Nadine Noki, and she started something as simple as a clothing line for women veterans. It's called Lady Brigade, please call and order shirts. Um, they're awesome. <laughs> but it's something as simple as being able to wear a t-shirt that says this is what a veteran looks like, and people kind of stop and turn, and they're like, oh, really? And you're like, yeah, and then you get to tell your story about how much fun you had while you were in the military. And I was 14 years old when I decided I wanted to join the Navy. I had to wait until I was 17 to be able to join the Navy, and I don't regret a second of it. Um, and I'm really proud to be dedicating my life and be a part of this amazing team that gets to help veterans within the community here in Vermont. So please stop out at our table, talk to us, take our business cards, um, spread the word about us. We want to assist all veterans in the state of Vermont. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Heather, for your dedication. Uh, Fred Latour is uh, from the American Legion of Vermont. Fred? I think it's old age here. It takes me a while to get up here. Uh, thank you, Senator, for this very important summit. Uh, it's nice to have all these veterans organizations uh, helping the veterans. We, the American Legion, are very concerned about veterans' issues. That's why we have Matt in Washington, D.C., doing a great job. Uh, what do we do in the Legion here in Vermont? We help the veterans and their families. Let me give you one, for instance. I had a, a female veteran uh, that was concerned about her tires on her car, uh, with her kids in the car and everything. And I had a project when I was a state commander. I got many thousands up to help veterans, and we bought her four tires. And, you know, to do things like that, something simple, so that those kids could be safe on the road. Again, thank you for coming to this summit. I'm going to make it short and sweet. Have a good day. Thank you again, Senator. Uh, you know, Fred says that that's just a simple thing. The truth is, enabling that family to get tires on the car so they can drive safely is no small thing. There's a lot, a lot of families around there, especially families with kids who don't have that 500 bucks that they need. And so a, a lot of what the uh, veterans organizations do is help out uh, veterans on a personal level, and that is much appreciated uh, as well. Um, the last but certainly not least is the gentleman who is now the acting director of the uh, medical center at White River. Uh, as you know, we've had some uh, turnovers recently, and the turnovers, ironically, were because our directors were doing an exceptionally good job and we needed elsewhere. And, you know, in some ways we are appreciative that they were doing such a good job. Uh, somebody mentioned before Deb Amder. You remember Deb? And Deb did a great job. And she was sent to Phoenix, where the, there was a hospital that had the most critical problems of any in the VA center. Washington tapped her uh, to go to Phoenix. Uh, so right now, uh, Brett Rush, Dr. Brett Rush, is the acting director. He is doing a very, very good job. I've had the opportunity to meet with him and his staff on several occasions. Uh, Brett, why don't you come on up and tell us what's going on in White River? So thank you, Senator, for having the VA here today. And I think it's just so important for the VA to have a seat at the table for this kind of meeting. You know, going last has its benefits. And I was sitting here listening to the stories of all of the work that has been done here over you know, the past years, if not decades, building up the types of services that we're able to provide in White River Junction. You know, yes, that was a lot of work you know, on the side of excellent directors in White River Junction like Deb Amder who helped to move our organization forward. But really, as you listen to these stories, what you hear is that everybody in the room, everybody in Vermont worked together you know, with a unified mission to try and ensure that veterans in Vermont provided 
are provided all of the services that they need to be successful and to have a high quality of life. And in, and in some ways, when you think about it, this is really the path forward for all of VA, right, is exactly this. Being in rooms, engaged with the community, working together with a unified mission that we all agree on. And yes, the VA has had problems, and there's no questions about that, right? But this is, this is the path forward, these are the solutions. And I think that Vermont has been showing the rest of the country the entire time how to do this. Um, I, I think you all believe that you have a pretty great VA system here in Vermont. You know, I hear that. You know, when I, when I talk with veterans, when I talk with, you know, medical uh, providers both within the VA and outside of the VA, I hear this, right? And so, you know, how do we, how do we take what has been working here in Vermont and continue to move that forward? And knowing that this is a time of change, you know, both in our country and as it relates to the VA and how we uh, approach veterans issues as a country how do we make sure that we can continue to move forward you know this this VA the White River Junction VA healthcare system is able to provide specialty medical surgical and psychiatric services that very few other VAs of this kind or other rural healthcare systems would ever have a hope of being able to provide and that's because of the work that everybody in a room like this has been doing for a long time we don't want to lose that Right? We want to continue to move forward. If anything, we want to continue to build up and provide more services than we've ever been able to do before. And I think that that's actually what everybody is here for today, is to think about how to do that and to learn what we're doing right now so that we can make sure that veterans in Vermont are getting what they need. One, one of the examples, I, I'm, a, I'm a doctor, right? So I'm gonna think about things like this as a doctor. I'm a psychiatrist specifically. I think about suicide prevention. This is really the biggest clinical priority that the VA has right now. We, we, we know that we still have 20 veterans who are committing suicide every day in this country. We know only six of them are getting services within the VA. That means that 14 out of those 20 veterans that are dying every day have not experienced the benefit or the potential for benefit that VA services can provide. We need your help. We have to work together, right? So if I only focus on what's in front of me, the six that are in my system right now, you know, we're not gonna get very far. If we all work together, we can actually do quite a bit. But the other thing that I know is that veterans who receive care within the VA are far less likely to ultimately have their lives end as a result of suicide as the ones who haven't come into the VA before. So why is that? I think it's two things. One, it's because the VA is full of professionals that are specially trained and understand veterans' issues. PTSD, traumatic brain injury, substance abuse, opioids, et cetera, chronic pain. It, it, it matters, expertise matters. And you have providers within our VA in, in Vermont here who are experts in these things. We have the National Center for PTSD at White River Junction. That matters, right? And so I don't, we want to partner with the community, but at the same time, we have to understand that the VA has something to offer that the community can't provide. And that's, I think, how we have to think about some of this. What's the second reason? It's because the VA is one of the only organizations left in this country that really continues a mission to providing whole services to an individual, into a specific type of individual, right, being the veteran. Most places don't do that anymore, right? And we're still, that is still our mission. All of the things that are going on notwithstanding, that is still our mission. You can't replace that, right? You can't send that out and sort of hope to get that replaced someplace else. Um, you know, we're, we're here to provide care for the whole person, to provide services for the whole person, for the whole veteran. So, you know, this, these are just things to be thinking about. Again, we appreciate being at the table here today. We want to work with you. We're all part of the same team here. And uh, I just appreciate, again, the invitation to be here and this opportunity to move forward together. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Rush. All right, what I'd like to do now is just open it up uh, to folks' questions and comments. If you could tell me who you are 
and then be loud and ask the question. And What's we've, the we've got three microphones around, so Haley in the middle, Kate over at the end, and Erica right here. So flag them down, and they'll come around to you with a mic. Um, Jeff Hazlitt, um, my father was a veteran, my mother was a veteran, God bless you both, I love you, and I'm a veteran. All of us got service with the VA in Vermont, and the service is outstanding here in Vermont. It is uh, the clinic that I go to in Burlington, and um, one of the reasons is because I think Everybody I've ever run into for two decades really cares about people and about servicing we, we, we as, as veterans. In that regards to the rest of you distinguished gentlemen at the table, I would like to make a suggestion. I'm so glad to hear all of you talk about privatization. Privatization will be the gate that opens up the flood of corruption that is now systemic in our political society with the few exceptions of a marvelous human being like Bernie Sanders. And I would encourage all of you as a group to get together and do a mailing and a public uh, promotion event asking all of us to increase your membership by getting all of us involved to contribute that we start a movement we don't, we're, we're, not, we're not passive, we must be active, not just talking to ourselves. We ask you organizations to start a movement, okay, to make sure that the message is loud and clear, don't dare privatize the VA. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Let me just pick up on Jeff's very good point. There is no medical institution in the world that is perfect. VA is not perfect. But what VA's function is about is not making billions of dollars in profit. VA's function is to serve veterans, and in doing that, many of the people who work at the VA are veterans themselves or have family members who are veterans. What I hear not only in Vermont but all over the country is that for the people who work at the VA, what they are doing is not a job, but a mission. And there's a, a lot of difference between somebody who's had a job to make money and somebody who understands that the people walking in the door are their brothers and their sisters. And that's what the VA, and the VA is there because you, the VA is you. And you got problems, there is the director of the VA, all right? His job is not to represent stockholders, right? It is to represent you. Do they do it perfectly? No, nobody does anything perfectly. But that is their job. And as Jeff's just said, we have got to be involved. We talked about suicides. Well, there are people today in Vermont and all over this country who are isolated, who are alone, whose part of their illness is they are afraid to reach out. And we have got to bring those people into the system. If they get into the VA, can we guarantee that they won't commit suicide? No. But as Dr. Rush just indicated, the number of people who are in the VA who commit suicide is a lot less than those who are not. Is that correct? All right. So that is all of our jobs. All right, let's keep going. I got a question over there, Kate? Okay. Yes, sir. My name's uh, Jonathan. I'm from Randolph. Uh, this is for you, Senator. Um, I was forced into retirement in December because of medical issues diagnosed and treated at the VA. You guys do a bang up job, thank you so very much. Um, I was encouraged by the social worker to put in my claim for social security. I began paying taxes in the 70s. So I've got my, I've got my quarters in, I think. Um, is there any effort underway or can there be an effort underway to streamline that process for medical disability claims that originate from VA medical staff. And what can I do to help? And I know I'm not the only one in this situation. Is there any way to, if it weren't for the people at SSVF, I'd be living on the street right now. Okay. Uh, 
before I answer that, let me mention again, the VA has people here, yeah? And we have in my own office, staff members, uh, Bernie Sanders, staff members, raise their hand. All right, all of these guys work five days a week on veterans' issues. So if anybody here has a personal issue, please contact my staff. One of the ongoing issues uh, with the VA for a number of years has been the time it takes to process a claim, period. Uh, the truth is that in recent years, uh, there has been a substantial improvement. Uh, when I first came into the Senate, uh, I think almost all the records were still in paper. And then there were these famous stories of warehouses actually sagging because of the thousands of pounds of paper uh, that they uh, had. Uh, obviously, in recent years, that has changed. So to answer your question, we are there to help you move that claim along as fast as possible. Uh, but that still remains a problem within the VA. But I think in recent years, uh, Dr. Rush, would you acknowledge that I think the VA has made a little bit of progress in, in, in expediting the claims uh, situation? They have made progress because Frank Senator, I was referring to the Social Security Administration. Oh. Oh, Social Security, all right, well then. Well, thank you for asking that one. All right, but here is, no, no, here's the issue there. If you do not like, and again, I don't mean to be political here, but this is an issue I've been deeply involved in. If you do not like Social Security, if you wanna get rid of Social Security, the fastest way to do it is not to hire the people, the staffing that you need in order to process claims. To answer your question, you're looking at the guy who in the recent budget got $480 million more for the Social Security Administration so they could hire more people to deal with the claims that are coming in. And that will mean, among other things, more staffing here in Vermont. There was a piece in the Washington Post about a year ago. This is what it said. It said that 10,000 Americans every year die while they're waiting for their disability claims to be processed. Can you believe that? All right. So we made some, process, some progress. We got 480 million in. I just spoke to the acting Social Security director. They're getting that money out to the field. But we got a lot more work to be done. Um, yeah, sure. Yes, uh, Dr. Rush, I'll direct this to you. I'm a graduate of the 2007 inaugural peer support specialist training in Boston, and I'm wondering if you can give me an update on the outlook on increasing the peer support specialist program at the VA. Thank you. So, so the peer support program... Doctor, speak into the mic th right there. Yeah. So the peer support program is actually uh, very important throughout the VA. There's uh, evidence that shows that peer support specialists being involved in a veteran's care as it relates to depression and PTSD um, improves outcomes. And so it is something that we're taking very seriously. Uh, you know, certainly I would say, you know, here in Vermont, we would like to, you know, push that forward and to have more of a footprint of, of peer support counselors here. Um, the, we're, we're, we're balancing having the right mix of people to make sure that we have both enough therapists and enough peer support specialists so that uh, that full spectrum of mental health care is there. Matt, did you wanna say yeah, one of that? I just wanna quickly brief our comment real quick. There's a bill also moving through Congress right now, I believe it's passed the House and it's, it's waiting for action in the Senate that sort of on, on a more narrow area, increases the number of peer-to-peer -peer support just for female veterans alone. I think we all understand that this is, female veterans in particular are the fasting, fastest growing demographic within the veteran community, and to make sure that not only is there peer-to-peer, -peer, but that they are exactly you know, female peer-to-peer -peer is really going to increase that. So we're working on that too, um, hopefully to expand that program as well. Okay, other questions? Yeah, Haley? Yeah. Hi, I'm Larry Rogers. I live over in Brandon on the other side of the state. <clears throat> I'd like to give you a half-hearted approval of privatization, okay? I have many things wrong with me. I'm currently seeing probably 10 doctors on a fairly regular basis. I see one VA doctor in Rutland. 
I see a lot of specialists, okay? They are all not non-VA because it's impractical for me to drive to White River Junction to see these people. Everything's working just fine except that these civilian specialists are prescribing me drugs which are currently costing me something over six or seven hundred dollars a month. I would like to be able to buy my drugs through the VA. Okay, the CHOICE program apparently gives me a path into this, but I have not got the complete details. I'm still trying to learn about this. I can't afford to continue to buy some of the drugs, so I've just stopped taking them, quite frankly. All right? Now, is this a bad thing? Am I pushing for privatization, Bernie? Okay, good point. Let me just say a word about that. The VA forever has had situations where people go outside the VA. For example, in the middle of the winter time, if you're living 100 miles away from White River, should you be having to go into White River for a, you know, a checkup? The answer is obviously not. Uh, if you have a particular problem that the VA is not able to deal with, should you be able to get your care outside of the VA? The answer is absolutely yes. And the VA has done that. And under, if you are wanting to get into a VA, and you have to, you're told you have to wait month after month and you need care, should you be able to go outside? The answer is yes. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. The fear is that there are some people very intentionally who want to destroy the Veterans Administration. And there are ways to do that through privatization. That's not what you're talking about. So the answer is yes, people should be able and do today take advantage of community health care. And we want that. But we don't want the door opened so wide that all of the financial resources that are now coming into the VA are diverted to outside care and there's nothing left for the VA. That's the issue. And in terms of prescription drugs, find out more. The VA has a strong prescription drug program uh, that could very well be of help to you. So find, get that answer out today. Okay, don't leave here without getting uh, that information. On a broader issue, I don't have to tell anybody here, if you're a veteran or not, that the prices of prescription drugs in this country are totally outrageous, that people by the millions cannot afford the medicine that their doctors prescribe, and this is an issue that has to be dealt with, and we have some ideas on how to deal with that. Senator? Yeah. I also just want to comment real quick. Um, and this is a plug for VFW. They are they have just just recently partnered with Express Scripts. That if you're a member of VFW, you also get a discount on prescription drugs. Uh, I also just want to say that it's the position of the American Legion and, and probably Senator Sanders that no veteran should ever have to pay a, a nickel or penny any type of money for any service connected disability for any medication. So we should definitely work on that. Um, to a bigger scale, in terms of choice, you'll notice that my Legion cap says Phoenix, Arizona. I live right down the street from the, well, I used to live right down the street from the Phoenix uh, VA. My brother still utilizes that VA. It's gotten a lot better. I will tell you this, Senator uh, Sanders mentioned a few minutes ago that there's 30,000 vacancies within VHA. That number could be as high as 50,000. We're not sure because VA at the national level isn't sure themselves. But the reality is, is when you have that many clinician vacancies, that's why choice has to be there because that means there's not a cardi cardiologist at this one particular hospital. They have to go out. We need to fill those vacancies so that the services that are needed by veterans are indeed at the VA. Okay, uh, yep. Uh, my name is John Turner. I live over in Bristol. Um, my name is John Turner. I live over in Bristol. Uh, for the last almost 11 years, working with the veteran community throughout the country has been an adamant part of my reintegration process. And one of the things that I've constantly noted um, around the country is that there are a number of veterans post 9-11 that have severe difficulties with the reintegration. Um, a few of the panelists touched on that before, but one of the things that I really want to put an emphasis on is to really work to empower the veteran to move beyond dependencies and these narratives that keep them in a hole. And that's, that's something that, that's very difficult to do, but Senator Sanders, you touched on yoga and acupuncture, and there's a number of programs out there, and there's a number of people that are willing to help these veterans and their family members appropriately reintegrate so that they don't become a statistic. 
In Vermont, over the last 10 years, it's been difficult at times to watch some of these programs flourish, but I can say, um, having had really good days at the VA and really bad days, that there is a great effort to push this program forward. One of the things that I think is, has been most cathartic for my own process is agriculture and utilizing the soil biome to actually release serotonin and to help rebuild communities and to help veteran farmers know and understand that they still have a community that they can serve through resilient food systems or whatever that looks like. This past week, the farm bill failed, which I think is a godsend because a number, uh, a very large amount of funding for veteran farmers and young farmers was, had, was decreased. So standing here as a farmer, as someone who works with the veteran community and who has a decent understanding of what's important to community, I would highly encourage you to, to, to speak on behalf of the farmers, of the Farmer Vote Veteran Coalition, all the other veteran farmers in the state to help push that agenda forward so that way there is funding for the veteran farmers. Thank you very much, John, for what you're doing. And what John is talking about, and, and there is a table out there, is you know people come home and being able to work in agriculture, getting their hands dirty, being part of a community, uh, sometimes brings a lot of peace to a troubled mind. Um, I want uh, Dr. Rush to say a word uh, also, if he could, uh, on a couple of programs that don't get attention, where, in my view, the VA is doing a tremendous job. I mentioned earlier about the crisis of opioid or heroin addiction. These guys have one of the great programs in the state of Vermont uh, dealing with addiction, a program that would cost somebody many thousands of dollars. I mean, it's like a Betty Ford type clinic uh, right here in White River. Uh, doctor, you want to say a word about that? And say a word also about the VA effort. We've heard a little bit about this today to reduce the, the level of opioid use so that our veterans do not get addicted. Yeah, so there, there, there's sort of two... Walk closer to the mic, please. There, there's two elements to this. So the, the first program that you're referring to is what we call the Residential Recovery Center, uh, which is a 14-bed residential recovery unit that we operate in White River Junction. Uh, the, the building in White River Junction where this unit lives is an outstanding green building. It actually has... Um, optical uh, trails that has uh, sunlight come down, you know, from the roof into the, into the building. And they've done just an excellent job of having a space where a veteran would feel comfortable checking in for 30 days or 45 days or whatever it is for that, uh, for that individual to, to be able to stay and to receive the, the care that's needed. And um, we, we serve veterans from Vermont and New Hampshire there. Uh, I, would, I would actually say, just because I've worked in mental health settings throughout the country, this is one of the nicest, most successful residential centers that I've ever seen. Doctor, yeah. in the private sector, how much would that type of treatment, a 30, 45 day treatment Well, if we were cost? talking about out-of-pocket costs or if there wasn't an insurance program that would pay for it, that could easily be more than $10,000 for a program. And how much like does it cost at, at White River? I mean, we... It's free. Yeah, it's part of our service, right? All right. So again, when people talk about the VA, they have an outstanding program available to any veteran who needs it, and it is cost is virtually free. So, so the second part of that, though, is that you know this is this is a two pronged approach, right? We provide you know care for addictions, and we provide appropriate care for chronic pain, uh, which are two separate things that oftentimes come together, um, but. We've, we've made a decision over the last few years to really um, look at, you know, uh, treatment of chronic pain and rehab, you know, as a single, as a single unit, right? And to, uh, we, we've, we have pain specialists who have been working at, with veterans who, are, who have been prescribed high doses of opioid pain medication for a long time to bring those, those uh, doses down because we know now what we didn't know before, which is that a lot of that is not safe. And you know we have an obligation to make sure that we, you know, uh, in a in a humane way, help veterans move to an area where their pain needs are met. 
um, but the treatment is safe. And we do that by you know, working on the medication side, but also by providing those uh, integrative wraparound services that uh, we know from an evidence perspective are part of the solution for chronic pain syndromes. Um, we're, we're working on developing uh, an accredited uh, pain rehab program um, so that we can really provide uh, intensive care to veterans who are ready to take on that challenge. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, we've got, uh, yep. <clears throat> thank you, Senator. Um, Bob Tortolani from Brattleboro, recently retired family physician and a Vietnam veteran. Uh, recently, we've started uh, through the uh, American Legion uh, post in Brattleboro, a, uh, a reach out program to veterans. So we have a coffee hour every Tuesday for an hour, hoping to help reduce the isolation uh, of, of our veterans. Uh, this has been going on for about two or three months now. It's successful, it's growing, and it's very good. We talk about anything without a specific agenda, and my question, Senator, has to do with the fact that so many of our veterans who are getting most of their care through the, uh, through the VA uh, are having difficulties with confusion regarding explanation of benefits. We all have that problem. That's not unique uh, to veteran population. We all can't figure out the explanation of benefits. Let's say a veteran who gets his services through the VA, has to go to the emergency department because of an emergency. He gets, uh, he gets a bill, explanation of benefits, unclear. It can even happen to someone who's totally disabled and gets a, uh, gets a bill, can't understand it. And all of the veterans in this group say they're having the same problem. It could be a small bill, a large bill. They don't have anybody to turn to to understand the explanation of benefits. And I thought we could f figure out with our local clinics, perhaps some designated person could be there to help them. Thank you. Good. Uh, that is an ongoing problem. There's no question about it. Uh, the VA is a, uh, a bureaucracy and it takes a lot of determination to make it through that bureaucracy. And that shouldn't be the case. It should be a lot simpler, uh, which is why, you know, frankly, my view is, and why I like the VA, is you let's simplify it, open the door, you got a problem, you come in and you get treated. That's it. You don't have to fill out 800 forms. Okay, uh, we're, uh, yeah, Kate. Hi, my name is Serena. Um, I'm a veteran, I'm a Cold War veteran, and I'm a female. I'm also a WAC. Some of you might know. My question is for your organizations there. What organization would I join if I wanted to be in one of your organizations? Mind you, I'm a Cold War veteran, not wartime. Years. Oh, my years of service is 77 to 79. As far as the American Legion is concerned, Congress determines who can join. Now, if you were in during the non-war year, you probably will not be eligible for any of our organizations. Well, maybe the, uh, at least for the American Legion, no. Anybody else? VFW is the same way. We uh, were only authorized to allow members in that the Congress lets it in. Okay. And obviously, Veterans of Foreign Wars is exactly what it says you have to have had served that's in a foreign that's war common, yeah. overseas. I'm just saying that, you know, there are, a, there are a group of us who were in the Cold War, but we weren't active in regards to, like, Vietnam. I went in two years after Vietnam was shut down, um, and then I got out before, what was the next one, Desert Storm or something like that? One of them <laughs> started up. Uh huh? Grenada. Let Matt take a shot at it. So I'm just wondering if there's any organization that someone who has, who, like me, who's a, who's a veteran, could join to help okay. out. Matt? Well, well, first, let me, let me quickly say thank you for your service. And I know what the Women Air Corps is. And I think it's particularly awesome that you're, that you're oh, sorry, Army Air Corps. Um, so I think it's particularly awesome. And so let me, they're absolutely right. They mentioned that Congress sort of sets the standards. So we're congressionally chartered organizations, which means that Congress sets the deadlines and dates of entry for us. There is a committee within the American Legion to engage Congress now to figure out if we can expand that, not only because membership is shrinking, but just because 
you have very, you know, very validated concerns and issues, right? I mean, so it's not fair for you not to be rec be able to join an organization and be recognized and be able to have the influence to, uh, you know, sort of influence Congress. So know that we're working on that. Um, it's, it's a conversation that we are having at a very senior um, national level, and hopefully something will come out, and, and I know that we'll probably be engaging Senator Sanders on that sometime, sometime in the near future. Unfortunately, it, it somehow deals with the IRS, and so you know how convoluted that system is about how the money is received from us and, and how it's utilized. So we're working on that, and, and it's only a matter of time before I'd like to be able to say that I will pay for your first year's membership at the American Legion. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Heather? Hi. Um, so just to kind of piggyback on what you said, I had the exact same issue when I came off active duty. Um, I actually joke with Mike Shawkett from the VFW, um, we go way back, about um, I was in D.C. on 9-11, why can't I join the VFW? Well, it's not a conflict. Then I say, you know, my father served in Vietnam, he was uh, um, EOD in the Navy actually, and I can join the auxiliary <clears throat> um, department of the VFW um, under my father's service, but then I say, but I served. I want to join something for my service. Um, I did join organizations such as the Farmer Veteran Coalition, um, because I am a farmer, maple syrup, um, and I also joined the Student Veterans of America because um, I was a college student. They're a national organization. They assisted with the Forever GI Bill. There are a lot of grass, well, SVA is not really grassroots anymore, but there's a lot of grassroots organizations here in Vermont that you can join and have just as much of a voice here in Vermont as you can with the legions and the VFWs. But I also encourage you to join the auxiliaries and still be a part of these amazing organizations. Um, so that's, but definitely there is a lack of women veteran organizations. Um, but there are some, there are ways that we can help out. So um, we can talk after. We'll help you try to find your niche, what you're interested in, farming or you know school, whatever, and uh, we'll figure it out. Okay. Um, I've got. Uh, we're. We got. Uh, I got some hands. Okay. Way in the back there. Yep. Uh, um, um, my name is Ron Griffin. Um, everybody in this room has heard about the opioid crisis, PTSD, TBI. I am what, it's look like, what it looks like, okay? A month ago, I was in a coma because of diabetes. It's brand new to me. And because of my support team at the VA, VFW, and so on, I told my doctor, no more, I don't want that oxycodone stuff, enough. Enough is enough is enough, because I had support. And this past week, I finally did five laps in the pool, and ran a half mile. First time in five years. My simple point is, if you know your neighbor is a veteran, if you know a veteran, if he doesn't get into the system with support, his neighbor will medicate him. And that's where the trouble comes. So if you know that, reach out to your neighbor and just say, hey, I know a guy. If, if you don't get in touch with him, I will. You're going to get a call. If I have to drag you by your cuff of your shirt, you're going to get help. Don't ever leave anybody behind. There's a bunch of people in this room that literally love their veterans, and that includes Senator Sanders. I was near suicide a year ago. I wasn't going to cut myself, but I was certainly couldn't care if I woke up or not. Senator Sanders' office and his staff literally saved my life. And that's why I'm here, to thank him in person, thank his staff in person. I'm what PTSD, TBI, and the opi opioid crisis looks like. But when somebody reaches out and says, hey, we love you, we got your back. Thank you. Uh, Ron, thanks for the courage to stand up and say that. And that is what all of us have got to do. I mean, the message that we're hearing is the VA alone can't do it. If people don't get into the VA, there's nothing that they can do. And our job is to reach out, and you've got a, 20 different organizations out there, and their own ways of doing that. We've got to work together to address these uh, issues. So, Ron, thanks very much. Uh, Haley, you got somebody? Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Dave Blodgett. I'm a disabled Marine Corps veteran. I'm also a postmaster for the Postal Service. Um, like the gentleman that just spoke, um, I am here for uh, mainly two reasons, opioids and also PTSD. 
sorry. Hey, Dave, everybody in this room is with you, and you're among friends. This is the first time I've been out of my house in a week. I live in my basement. I have a wife that I haven't slept in the same bed in within four months because <laughs> I attack her. In my sleep, I've hit her. I've taken her arm, bent it back, almost broke her arm, and I wake up and don't know anything. Um, I'm not here to make accusations. I'm here for solutions. I am a 60% disabled veteran. Um, I don't want to make this about me, but I had surgery on my neck, vertebrae replaced a few months ago. My lower back needs to be fused. Um, I tried to file online in August of 2016, and I included PTSD. And also, for each of my conditions, you have a form that's 13 pages long for each condition. So I took it to my physician for my primary health care. He said, I'm not filling that out. You need to go to the VA. So I go to the VA, and the doc says, I'm not going to fill it out. You need to take it to your physician. And then I'm in the TBI program, and I actually go to Manchester rather than, than White River. I, don't need to go into reasons why, but um, I try to file online, and I have to upload each of those pages that the doctors either can't or won't fill out. And then um, for PTSD, I see a physician, and I'm told, well, you have to file online. I work for the VA. I can't give you a diagnosis. I can't say that you have PTSD. Okay, Dave, this is, I mean, I think we've heard this, this is a problem. So you're here today, there are people here, don't leave today unless you have the name and one number of somebody who's going to call you up in a few days, all right? So let's see if we can work on your issue today. Okay, and re real quick for the opioids, a lot of people, everything is cut, you know. Um, everybody needs to be aware they're there for a reason. There are people that legitimately need it. I have almost migraines every day, and I don't know if this took or not, but I feel like my head is going to explode, and my lower back needs to be fused. Yep. They've cut my medication. I, was, I don't sleep. Every time I turn, I, I wake up. They cut me from six pills a day of oxycodone, 20 milligrams, which is a lot. I understand that, but I'm not going in the street and asking, okay? I got cut from 20 to 15 to 10, and now from six to five, okay? When I don't sleep, I'm in so much pain, I take the medication. I run out a week early. It's, it has to be understood that the, it is there for a reason. Yes, I yep. understand there's abuse. Yes, I understand all these other things. But there are situations, and the doctors are afraid they could lose their license. Mr. Sanders, just, if you can understand, there are, leg People Absolutely. No one argues it. with that, Dave. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, the Thank goal is... Yeah, okay. Thanks very much for sharing that, Dave. Okay. Other questions? Yep. Kate? Hi. Uh, I'm George Johnson. Um, I want to thank everybody at the White River VA. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, I see everybody from cardiac, pulmonary, three different surgeons, um, and everything else. They've been unbelievable. Now, I do have to dis one dispute about the claims process and that nonsense. I've been fighting my battle since 1999. And then I gave up at about 2003, and I wouldn't even go near the VA or do anything. Then I heard on the radio, it was around 2006, Bernie was doing an open house, and I took everything within me to actually pull into that parking lot. And then I saw Bernie, and he told me, don't ever give up. And, of course, it's been going on since then, took down to 2011. A BVA judge said, okay, he's awarded any and all compensation hereby granted. VA comes back, gives me 150 bucks a month. This is after I lost my house and was homeless for five years because of this. And bank walked away with 120 grand in equity. That was awesome. And finally took till... 2013, 14, where they ended up giving me the 100%, but nothing retro and been fighting it ever since. 
And finally, I had to bring it to the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims in D.C., which told the VA to compensate me. It got remanded back there a year ago, and I also, they've had a claim in since 2013. Get a hold of the BVA, they go, oh, we're working on 2015 cases, but yours dated 2013. So when are you gonna hear my case? No answer. Could be another year or two. And the thing is, what I found with the claims is, they had a huge backlog in initial claims, and then basically what they did was turn around and deny them, so then it goes to the appeals process and we can go, oh, see how many claims we've cleared up. And believe me, I know more about <laughs> veterans law than I really wanna know. <laughs> My case file is over 4,000 pages. And you know, the service, the, all of ESO guys, um, they're doing their damnedest, but they're swamped. Ask them how many people they have to deal with in claims. And it's just, and now they started this new thing out of Jonesville, Wisconsin, where all your, I just went through it three, you know, three months ago. Send it right to the Board of Veterans Appeals. You do, sets there. Now they send it up to Jonesville. You can't even find out if it made the deadline date. I mean, it's, that's my big complaint. But I want to thank everybody and your help, especially, and your staff has been great. And anybody and everybody from janitor on up who works in the White <laughs> River, they're awesome. So thank you. Thank you. All right, maybe, uh, yeah, just a couple of more. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Arthur Trezice from Face in Vermont. And I'm a veteran from the Korean conflict, 1951 to 50, 52. And I just came this morning from the Veterans for Peace meeting at the Hunger Mountain Co-op. And this lady in the front who spoke a few minutes ago, you may join our organization today, no problem. We have women and men both in the organization. And the point I wanna to make today is, is that we've been parading all over Vermont for years and the complaint from many of our members is, is that we try to promote the idea of making peace rather than war. And I've never met a more committed group of veterans in my life than they have at these meetings. They've been there from the time of the Vietnam War, the Korean War, and the conflicts in the Middle East. And they all come back with an appreciation of the horrors of war, and they try to do something about it. So we're going to be in the parade in Middlebury and in Virgins on Armistice Day with a banner that shows the size of the military defense budget in comparison with the budget for the diplomatic section or the Department of State and in, co in, in comparison with the veterans benefits who have been in all these wars. And the size of the military budget is so grossly out of proportion to the other two that I mentioned that we're showing it in a banner that goes for about 40 feet, if we can get that much space in the parade, and it shows how much goes for the military and war mechanisms which go far beyond defense. And we feel as though we never get any traction in these presentations because people don't seem to be aware of what's going on in the preparation of the military budget because it's all engineered by insiders who are corrupt. And this was the comment of the very first person that spoke tonight, today. He said, I'm, I'm disappointed in the corruption in government and we veterans should all be more active and we citizens should be more active and this lady that wanted to join the veterans group, we meet at the Hunger Mountain Co-op on the third Saturday of every month from 10 to 12, and we're trying to do something about the corruption. Okay, so thank you, please. thank you very much, Arthur. Let me just pick up on Arthur's point. In my experience as a senator, not only meeting with veterans organizations, obviously I meet with Department of Defense folks as well. And interestingly, I would not have necessarily told you this a long time ago, do you know who some of the people who are most concerned about getting our men and women dragged into another war are military people who have lived through those experiences. They know what war is like. And um, I, that was a surprising revelation to me. Okay, maybe one more question. You got Kate back there? Yeah. Hello. Hello. 
Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, I got it. <laughs> they, 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 oh, sorry. Uh, thank, thank you for having me. Um, I work, I, I served nine years, thank you. I served nine years in the Army as Army paratrooper. I spent 27 months in Afghanistan in Kunar province, and I was injured on my second deployment. And like some of the younger veterans, like John Turner said earlier, the reintegration process has been a difficult one for a lot of veterans. I've been out three years, and I feel like I'm still reintegrating into society. And I've been lucky enough, not necessarily through the VA, the VA does have some good benefits and has some good things that have helped me direct, direct me in the right path, but then also at times, I have, it's failed me. And like many of our veterans, we've been at war now 17 years almost, and we're coming up on a time where a soldier will spend 20 years of service, and three years from now, his whole entire career, his or her, her whole entire career will have been spent training to go to war, going to war, training to go to war, going to war. And then when you come back home, you, when you're getting out of the service, I got medically retired out of service after my injuries on my second deployment, and you go through an ACAP process. It's a week-long process, and they just cram a thousand things into one that's not specified to a, a veteran with disabilities or just a veteran that's getting out of the service. And then when you get out, you come back, and then there's some help reintegration, but then you're just kind of left. And it's almost like a part-time job trying to work the VA system, trying to get your benefits right. And it's very difficult, especially if you're trying to get back on your feet and get your family settled, right? And it's, it's, it's the reintegration, I think, should also be at a VA level where veterans are coming back. I, I work for a nonprofit here in Vermont called Vermont Adaptive Ski and Sports, and we do 100% free veteran activities every single week. We've served over, we've done 300 individual activities in the last five months for veterans that go skiing, snowboarding, ice climbing, sailing, everything across the board. And that's a process that helps veterans reintegrate. The VA has rec therapists that could partner with organizations like ours and other uh, adaptive sports programs and stuff like that through the state. And Burlington Lakeside has done a great job at that. And we've had some help from White River. But it, it, there, there could be improvement and where we aren't losing our veterans. I call them the veterans in the hills because that's what I was on. I was on going to the hills. I bought land up in the hills here in Vermont so I could isolate and disappear off the grid. And luckily, one of the peer supports, Josh Gershmoff at Burlington Lakeside grabbed me up before I disappeared because I made three appointments and it wasn't working for me. I was on disappear. And luckily he directed me into a community-based program that's free for veterans like mine, John Turner's, and there's many more veteran-based programs. But I think there needs to be a bigger push towards that, a healthier living style because we got 78% of veterans that are overweight right now. And is that due to opioids? Is that due to the psych medications that put on weight? And then they create isolation in itself. You go into the VA, you isolate. You go into your house, you isolate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me, um, all right, the people here are not gonna disappear. So if you have any other questions or comments, uh, they will remain here. But uh, let me just uh, conclude uh, this part of the uh, day by thanking all of the panelists uh, for uh, their presentations and making everybody here aware. We got staff here uh, who are here precisely to take your names and your phone numbers. We will be back to you next week if there are any issues that we can help out with. So thank you all very, very much.